Hello, this is Miss Augustine. We are continuing in Chapter 6. This is actually my fifth recording, but we really talked about five other parts already, so bear with me. So we're going to talk about ionic bonding today. So ionic bonding is um, what is occurring in ionic compounds, and ionic compounds are composed of anions and cations that are combined so that the numbers of positive and negative charges are equal. So remember when we talked about electronegativity differences determine whether a bond will be nonpolar covalent, polar covalent, or ionic. So when the electrons are equally shared, it's nonpolar covalent. If the electrons are shared but not equally, it's polar covalent. And if the electrons aren't shared at all, somebody got the electrons and somebody lost the electrons, it's an ionic compound. And recall that when you gain electrons, you form an anion. And when you lose electrons, you form a cation. So ionic compounds are represented by something called a formula unit that shows the lowest whole number ratio of atoms in an ionic compound. So like all molecular and ionic substances, there's millions and millions of these things hanging out together in a compound. And so the formula unit is going to show you that lowest whole number ratio of anions to cations in a compound. And ionic compounds exist as this three-dimensional array of ions, and they're held together by the force of attraction between oppositely charged ions. So compounds that are comprised of metal, non-metal bonding are ionic. And if you remember, metals have very low electronegativities. Non-metals have high electronegativities. And so the non-metals get the electrons and the metals lose the electrons. We could also talk about ionization energies. Metals have very low ionization energies because they tend to have the larger radii, and the nonmetals tend to have very high ionization energies. They don't lose their electrons, and that's why they end up getting the electrons. So other ions that we talk about are polyatomic ions, and these are ions that are made up of more than one atom, and typically polyatomic ions are covalently bonded groups of atoms that carry a net charge, positive or net charge. They behave like atoms, and they're very common and stable in nature. And they have special names, and one example would be ammonium, which is the NH4 plus one ion. So ionic compounds are neutral. So that means, and I like to point this out, all compounds are neutral. So if the name tells you it's a compound, it's electrically neutral. If the name is ion, if it has ion in it, then it has a charge. So the reason I'm stressing that compounds are neutral, when you're talking about ionic compounds, you have to make sure that the formula you write represents a neutral compound. That means you're combining a cation and an anion. The charges have to add up to zero. So the charge of the cation plus the charge of the anion equals zero, and that results in a neutral ionic compound. Why, you ask, do we have to do this? Because that's what happens in nature. That's the way they fly. Compounds are neutral. So if you had A with a plus one and X with a minus one, the formula unit AX has a net charge of zero because plus one minus one equals zero. So some properties of ionic compounds, they have this repeating 3D pattern. Most are crystalline solids at room temperature with a few exceptions here and there. And some characteristics of ionic compounds, they tend to have high melting points because remember, there's this force of attraction between the positive and negative ions. They are conductive in molten states. They typically exist in crystalline form. And they have a tendency to dissolve in water. Water is a polar molecule, and so it's able to attract and pull into solution these ionic substances in general. And 
when they are dissolved in water, they have the ability to produce electrical conductivity. And that's because these charged ions can carry the current. We also talk about ionic compounds having a coordination number. And the definition of the coordination number is it tells you the number of ions of opposite charge that surround each ion in a crystal. And so, for example, sodium chloride has a coordination number of six. And so if I showed you a model of sodium chloride and you counted, each of these particular ions is attached or surrounded by six ions of opposite charge. And then we talk about metallic bonds. And down here is a picture of metallic bonding. The definition is it consists of the attraction of free floating electrons that are uh, surrounding positively charged metal ions. So metallic bonds are what occur in metals. And they are believed to be composed of closely packed cations, so that's these little pluses here, surrounded by a sea of mobile valence electrons. And again, the properties of metallics, compounds, metals in general, can be explained due to this metallic bonding. So the requirements, there must be vacant valence electrons. They must have low ionization energies so that these loosely held electrons are available for bonding. Oops, sorry, didn't mean to go so fast there. And so again, this mobile electron situation is what accounts for this so-called floating sea of electrons. Whenever you hear sea of electrons, you say, ah, oh, that must be metallic bonding. Properties of metallic bonded substances, they are good conductors. And again, they can conduct electricity because these electrons are free floating. And they, um, electrons can enter one end of the metal and conduct their way through and leave at the other end. They're malleable, capable of being hammered into different shapes, and they are ductile, capable of being drawn into wires. So again, this is a way of explaining how metals behave this so-called sea of electron metallic bonding model. So that's all I wanted to talk about for now. This is Ms. Augustine signing off.